And that brings us to the day in sport with Darren Murra. And as uh, the Matildas, they're back tomorrow in action. Can they bounce back from that loss to the French? Well, they have the talent to do so. Tomo, good evening, mate. The team is preparing to take on England in London and it'll be another test of the Matildas' squad depth. Several big names are taking a break because of fatigue, but it gives some young players a chance to step up. Managing burnout will be key as they have one eye on next year's World Cup. The Matildas are a team in demand. Top nations want to play them and fans are desperate to see more of them. But the crowded calendar has become a punishing one for our top players. The irony is not lost on the squad's veterans. It's a lot of football, but at the same time we've always wanted a lot of football and now we're getting a lot of football and so it's sort of uh, you know, take and give kind of situation, isn't it? Many Matildas play two seasons in a year, one in the US and one at home. It's been sort of consistent football, which has been amazing for our development because a lot of us have a lot more experience at international level and in big leagues than we probably should at our age. But it also is a big test on our bodies and minds and not having as much break as a lot of other leagues and countries in the world would. The decision to rest key players on this short European tour, like Sam Kerr and Alana Kennedy, has allowed younger players to step up. 15-year-old Mary Fowler earned her second cap in the 2-0 loss to France, while big things are expected of Princess Abini. The 18-year-old says she and her fellow young guns have enjoyed their international experience. I don't think it's so much pressure on the player as it is more of on the coach, like make, taking that risk. And like for the player, it's more like nerves. England will be another tough opponent for the Matildas. They were unbeaten during their World Cup qualifying campaign and are coming off a 1-0 win over Brazil. Under new coach Phil Neville, the Lionesses have transformed their playing style. They've got some really strong, quick, powerful players that can finish and be dangerous all over the park. So it'll be a really tough game again. Neville says Australia is his dark horse to win the World Cup, which is just 241 days away. In London, Ben Lewis, SBS World News. And you can tune into SBS to see how the Matildas fare against England. Coverage begins from 4.30 tomorrow morning, Eastern Daylight Time. Streaming also available on the World Game website. Well, Sam Kerr may not be lining up to play England, but the striker is one of 15 players shortlisted for the inaugural Women's Ballon d'Or Award. Kerr was overlooked for FIFA's World Player of the Year prize. Luka Modric and Kylian Mbappe are among the nominees for the men's Ballon d'Or. The winner will be announced in December. Aaron Moy has withdrawn from the Socceroos training camp in the United Arab Emirates and will not line up in next week's friendly against Kuwait. The midfielder injured his groin playing for club side Huddersfield at the weekend. It comes a day after goalkeeper Matt Ryan also withdrew to recover from minor injuries. To cricket and Australia's openers are fighting back on day three of the first test against Pakistan in Dubai. Usman Khawaja and Aaron Finch have both registered their half centuries. At lunch, Australia was none for 137, trailing by 345 runs. Australia resumed at none for 30. Missed it down the leg side. And... Osman Khawaja capitalised from a missed stumping, but there was still a mountain to climb. So a missed opportunity there for Pakistan. Aaron Finch was looking confident. Over the top, flat and six. He soon notched up his first Sweet test shot. half century. And it's a boundary and it brings up a very good 50. Overnight, Pakistan piled on the run rate. That is into the rope. That's the 150 partnership between Shafiq and Sahail. Australian debutante Manas Labushain finally broke through to remove Asad Shafiq on 80. He's done it! On debut, he's picked as a batsman and he's picked up a wicket. Great bowling, great comeback delivery. Before running out Baba Azam on four. A little bit. Run out of opportunity and I think Baba is gone. Oh look, you know, I'm just happy that I was able to contribute in some way um, out there. Was, you know, we fought really well for two days there and anything to contribute to the team. Pakistan batsman Harris Sohail joined opener Mohammad Hafez in scoring a ton. The second run, it's a great century. It's a fantastic moment for the left-hander. His first Test match, 100. He went on to score 110. Oh, that's it. Hopefully it is. Before Pakistan was bowled out for 482. Daniela Rintilli, SBS World News.
And in women's cricket, Jess Jonasson and Nicole Bolton have been named in Australia's squad for next month's World T20 in the Caribbean. They're the only additions to the Australian side that claimed a T20 series clean sweep against New Zealand last week. Jess is always going to come back in being you know, one of the best T20 bowlers in the world and out injured, so it's exciting to the thought of having her back in. Uh, and Nick Bolton, I think, has uh, been a real revelation the last 12 months in, in T20. A similar one-day international squad was also named for the three-match series against Pakistan in Malaysia next week. The T20 squad will then play three matches against Pakistan in Kuala Lumpur before heading to the West Indies for the World Cup. To tennis, and Nick Kyrgios has again attracted unwanted attention at the Shanghai Masters. The Australian was beaten in three sets by American qualifier Bradley Klan. But in the second set, he reacted to chair umpire Damien Dumossois, who questioned his effort, calling it borderline. Kyrgios then continued his spat at the next break of play. I said borderline only. Borderline, just borderline. That's it. That's it. Last year, Kyrgios sensationally walked off the court after the first set, protesting against an umpire's call. Well, of course, Kyrgios has already lost his top Australian ranking to Alex Di Menor, who progressed to the second round in Shanghai. The 19-year-old took an hour and 51 minutes to defeat Canadian Vasek Pospisil in straight sets. And next year's Australian Open could be the first Grand Slam to permit on-court coaching. It was one of the major issues to arise from the US Open women's final involving Serena Williams. A meeting of tennis bosses later this month will attempt to resolve the inconsistency in how the rule is applied. We think it's, it's upon the governing bodies of tennis to have a consistent approach. You don't want to have one week one way, another week another way, because it's very difficult for the fans to understand that and also for the players to grasp the changes. Confirmed changes to next year's tournament were announced today, including the introduction of an extreme heat index, more prize money and cheaper admission tickets. Russia continues to dominate after two days of competition at the Youth Olympics, leading the medal tally with 11 gold. In the first ever staging of the breakdancing event, the Russian team Bumblebee beat Team Martin of France. The competition, of course, is based on an urban style of dance, as you can see there, and two breaker teams battle out a number of rounds adjudicated by two judges. Team Ram of Japan edged out Team Emma of Canada in the girls' division. Australia has won three silver medals and a bronze all coming in the pool. And finally in sport, a statue of Peter Norman will be made and placed at Lakeside Stadium in Melbourne. The 200 metre silver medalist at the 1968 Mexico Games stood in solidarity with two American athletes who made a black pow salute on the podium. His time of 20.06 seconds remains the Australian record. Earlier this year, Norman was posthumously awarded the Order of Merit by the Australian Olympic Committee. A real legend there, Tomo. Yeah, a real legend. He died in 2006 and, uh, well, his legend continues. Good to see. Thanks, Darren.